So hi everybody, sorry again for the delay. Um, we're going to talk about Euro dollar, which is quite exciting today and will be even more exciting uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow and of course on Friday. Um, so uh, everybody ready? We'll begin. Yeah. Uh, it's about time, right? So um, my name is Yochai Lam. I founded Forex Crunch back in 2008. The site focuses on fundamental analysis, but also touches on technical analysis. I see fundamentals as uh, what's important for moving markets and technicals for entry points, exit points, and things like that. I used to be a retail trader and a computer programmer. Uh, that's it. Let's begin. So what will cover current state of euro dollar will run fast. Uh, we've seen uh, a fall on the rise. Um, the reasons for the rally and the fall, uh, preview for the ECB meeting tomorrow. Um, we'll talk about the Eurozone, uh, and then we'll move on to the United States, the state of the Fed, and we'll preview the non-farm payrolls. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A session. Now the Q&A session will be held in the chat box. Okay, not in the Q&A box, but in the chat box. I'll say that once again once we reach uh, the Q&A session. All right. So um, this is what we're seeing recently in Euro dollar. Um, uh, quite a rally. The, the pair fell to 104.60, made it all the way just 1,000 pips up to uh, 114.60, and now it's and it fell back to 108.20, and now it's rallying once again. This is a chart taken um, an hour ago or so. So uh, these are the levels to watch. Um, they're on the screen, 120, 11876, 11750, 1650, 1460, which is a critical level. 1373, 1290, 112, which we've seen today. 1111, uh, 110, of course, very round number, 10820, 10750, 106, and the 12 year low of 10460. Now, the big picture is a bit different. It's actually quite a big fall from 140 this time last year in May to be correct, uh, 13 months ago, uh, to these levels. So there is, of course, a big question, have we bottomed out or not? And we'll tackle this, of course, very soon. All right, so why did the euro fall? Why did euro and dollar fall? Well, basically, it's monetary policy divergence. So you see ECB President uh, Mario Draghi looking one way and uh, Fed Chair Janet Yellen looking the other way. Um, and I'll explain this uh, incidental picture. Um, the uh, European Central Bank, the ECB, is not set to raise rates until 2017. It's a mistake here. And is keen on Im implementing QE. Um, the Fed ended QE back in October 2014, and the rate hike is getting closer this year. And markets responded. Uh, but what about the recent rally? Well, I see it as three, well, talk about three points, pushing the euro higher. Hope for Greece. It's very, very, it's very um, strong, especially this week. Uh, some good economic figures from the eurozone and the turnaround in bonds, uh, which had an impact on the previous rally, not this one. So we'll run about this uh, shortly. And of course, dollar weakness. Um, but for uh, Greece, uh, four-month extension uh, is now was reached in the last moment back in February. And the time is running out for this extension to expire. So, and the most important deadline is just this Friday, June 5th. It's when um, Greece has to pay the IMF more and it doesn't have the money to do so. Uh, so that's why this week we're seeing every uh, bit of news from Greece having a bigger impact than we've seen so far. Um, and uh, basically we know that nobody wants a Grexit. Everybody wants Greece to be in the Eurozone. Greece needs to feel part of Europe. Uh, switching to independent currency can help economically if it's devalued, of course, uh, but the transition could be too painful. Uh, Germany, on the other hand, also needs weaker economies in the Eurozone to weaken the Euro, and the Eurozone needs to remain irreversible in order to avoid a contagion, because once we see one country leave, others could do that as well. I think that German Chancellor Angela Merkel, she doesn't want to see any uh, it changes. Um, of course, each side has different opinion opinions. Um, so during the crisis, uh, there was a small impact on the euro back in February, but now the impact is much stronger this week because we're three days from uh, the IMF payment. Both sides are reporting po progress, 
there's still a difference. Uh, Greece is reporting much more progress, and um, each time um, Eurozone creditors pour uh, cold water on these uh, hopes, on this optimism. And Greece is, of course, not the only thing moving euro dollar. Um, second thing is we're seeing improvement in the Eurozone. Um, we're seeing no more deflation. We just received uh, inflation figures for May. These are preliminary figures, but usually are confirmed. We see a rise of 0.3% uh, in prices in, C in headline CPI. This is, of course, much weaker than uh, the 2% or a bit below target that the ECB has, but it's uh, better than seeing prices fall. And finally, today, we've seen also core prices moving a bit up. They were stuck on uh, plus 0.6%. And now they're rising 0.9%, so it's still low, but it's better news, right? So um, also other factors helping is we're seeing strong growth in Spain. I'm sitting here in Spain, and I can't say I'm seeing it on the street, but at least the numbers are positive. So it's 0.9% quarter over quarter, which is very strong. German unemployment continues falling. We've received fresh data today about this. Uh, consumer confidence, business confidence is generally higher. Uh, perhaps it dropped a bit recently, but in general it's better. And forecasts have been raised, and uh, both, uh, well, the ECB, uh, the European Commission, the German government, all have raised forecasts. So these are sort of positive figures helping uh, the euro. Um, w why is the, the eurozone recovering? Well, of course, a weaker euro. Uh, ECB lending uh, is reaching the real economy, for example, here in Spain. Mortgages are now cheaper, so uh, people have more money in their pockets to spend. Um, as I said, weaker euro helps exports. In some places, it just couldn't get worse. And um, also inflation, I mean, it isn't good to have strong inflation, but with inflation, we're seeing since the beginning of the year some kind of stabilization or rise in oil prices, and this is lifting inflation from the deep lows. Okay, so all these reasons are helping the eurozone. It's still a fragile recovery. It's not a real one. It's not a sort of a, a virtuous cycle of growth and more employment and more spending, but it's we're off the bottom in the Eurozone. Okay, so um, it took uh, the Euro, the common currency, to respond, but finally the data is reaching uh, the Euro. Um, and of course, <laughs> it helps Euro dollar that also the US dollar is weak. And the biggest force moving um, the euro is, of course, ECBQE. <clears throat> so, what was announced back in March? <clears throat> Sorry, it was announced back in January. Um, and since March, the European Central Bank creates 60 billion euros out of thin air and buys bonds. So far, it had no problems implementing the program. The program is expected to last until September 2016. That's a total of one over 1 trillion euros. It could last longer depending on the consequences. Okay, so that's a big question. When will QE end, like it was in the United States? Um, <clears throat> it's euro negative because, well, creating more euros makes it uh, less valuable. And, of course, when the ECB buys bonds, the sellers are expected to use it in the real economy. So that's monetary stimulus. Um, and some of the money just goes out of the eurozone. And we've seen uh, American uh, corporations uh, raise money in the eurozone and euros, and it was uh, quite cheap. So, um, and this money, of course, then leaves the Eurozone. Uh, so, eventually, uh, weaker, uh, the ECB QE program makes the Euro weaker, and a uh, weaker Euro makes imported goods more expensive, raising inflation and avoiding the deflation vicious cycle, um, a cycle in which prices fall, people expect them to fall, they buy less, factories produce less, they fire people, less money. That's, that's what the ECB tries to avoid. Now, um, but a uh, weaker euro, of course, makes exports more attractive, and this is eventually good for the eurozone. So the ECB QE program is expected to self-correct. So we have a weaker euro, it helps the eurozone, and then the eurozone improves, and it strengthens the euro, right? That's the, that's the idea of the whole um, program, eventually. Um, so uh, we're also seeing, because... Some of the money coming out from the ECB goes into stocks, European stocks. We, we are also seeing money from outside flow into European stocks, and that also lifts the euro because money is entering the eurozone. So there is sort of this uh, pendulum, this self-correction thing in the markets, uh, and it is beginning to self-correct. But as aforementioned, we had such a big fall from the highs 
Um, and I doubt that this uh, correction will uh, continue, but let's can. So, um, why am I skeptical about this correction? First of all, it takes time in order to see a real growth and in inflation, um, because uh, the, the recovery is still fragile. Uh, we're still uh, uh, sort of in the baby steps of this uh, recovery, and unemployment is still high. In addition, for euro dollar, the Fed is yet to, to hike this year, and uh, I believe we'll see this correction only much later in the year. We'll talk about that later also. But, um, and another thing uh, that is helping the euro that we're seeing uh, a squeeze of shorts. I mentioned this uh, last time. For those of you who attended last time, I will run about it on it shortly. Um, so money was flowing into the eurozone, into European bonds in anticipation of QE. Then when QE was announced, it intensified, more money went into bonds. And, and then when we had a successful implementation of QE, even more money flowed uh, um, into European bonds. But if you're investing in uh, European bonds, you want to hedge against the weakness of the currency. So you go short on the euro. And uh, when these shorts are squeezed, uh, things turn around and also pushes the euro higher. That's what happened uh, back in April. May we haven't seen much of that, so I won't uh, dive into that. Um, but um, it happened back in April 15th. And Draghi clarified that rates were not moving. That was the last ECB decision. Six days later, six days later, uh, Bill Gross, which has a big impact on markets, said that boons are the short of a lifetime, but you have to wait until September 2016. Markets didn't wait. Uh, they began selling German bonds. That means that also euro shorts were squeezed, and the euro went higher all the way to 114.50. Um, this is, uh, we we're also seeing other factors that help that rally. Um, um, well, the sell off in euro bonds. The euro went higher also against other currencies. Um, it's something to watch. It didn't happen uh, in May once again, um, but it's also these kind of self-correcting effect as, as tied to the weaker euro and the imports and the exports. It happened also in these short positions that were squeezed. Too many people uh, went short on the euro, and when everybody's short, nobody's there to sell. So after a big, big fall, we had a rally. Anyway, uh, in, will the euro continue rising? I, I think it's limited, um, and we did see it stop at 114.50, falling back all the way to 108. Um, we're still having ongoing ECBQA um, at negative deposit rate in the eurozone, and all this weighs on the common currency. <clears throat> so it's a big correction. It was needed for a long time, but uh, the direction, as I see it, is still down. So, uh, and then we had in May a big fall of the euro dollar uh, from 114.50 to 108.20. Uh, so there were two factors, of course, as always with currency trading. Um, we had um, in the US uh, positive figures. On the US side, we had a return to a gain of over 200,000 jobs in the non farm payrolls, positive data, uh, especially building permits and jobless claims. And reassurances from the Fed that they will hike this year. We heard Yellen repeating that. We, ha we heard other Fed officials. We'll dive into that a bit later in five, ten minutes or so. From the European side, uh, we had talk about front loading QE. So, a member of the ECB, Kaur, his name is, he was speaking privately to hedge fund managers. How convenient. And he said that the ECB will likely uh, intensify its bond buying program before the summer, uh, buying more bonds because in the summer uh, markets are less liquid. As we know, many people are on vacation and uh, the conditions aren't so ripe for buying more bonds. So if we front load QE, it means we're buying more bonds now. That means more devaluing, intensified devaluing of the eurozone. So um, that, of course, weighed on the euro. In addition, Mario Draghi, in uh, public appearances, he repeated his determination to continue with QE. This is the key thing, um, because all this good data uh, was uh, was seen by the European Central Bank. It also raised the forecasts, but uh, Draghi confirmed time after time that in order to see these forecasts realized, we have to see um, the program, the QE program, realized in full. 
And another thing that hurt the euro was that we had lower than expected growth, only 0.4%. Now, it's not bad for the eurozone, but if this is what it could produce on, on in Q1 when the euro was so weak, that's a bit uh, worrying, especially as um, the lower than expected growth came from uh, Germany, which is uh, the eurozone's uh, leading country. So what do we have tomorrow? Um, Wednesday, we have a rate announcement at 11.45 GMT. No change in policy is expected. The main lending rate stands at 0.05%. The deposit rate is at negative 0.20%. And the QE program is at 60 billion euros per month. No change in policy is expected. We're focusing on the press conference, which begins at 12.30 GMT. Uh, these are four topics to watch. If you remember last time, we had a protester, a young lady, interrupting the show, throwing confetti and Draghi, and the ECB press conference was stopped. It just stole the show. But we had a message in general that QE is here to stay. Um, this time, I believe security will be a bit tighter, and we'll have more focus on Draghi. So these are the four topics to watch. Details about front-loading. Uh, will Draghi uh, reject this or confirm this? Uh, this has an immediate impact on markets. Um, updated forecasts, uh, hint about the end date of QE because reporters always ask that, okay, we have improvements, will you end QE earlier? And of course, questions about Greece because the deadline is coming on Friday. Perhaps we'll have a deal by tomorrow, <clears throat> perhaps not. I believe we won't have, but anyway, uh, he'll be asked about that. So, front-loading QE. Um, will the ECB push harder with QE? Uh, why He will be asked why was this comment published privately, he will be scrutinized by reporters. Um, and um, if the ECB needs to um, front load uh, QE to, to print more euros now, does it have problems with QE? All these are important questions. I think the drug is expected to send a business as usual message. Everything is going on as expected. We have no problems with QE. Um, if you will say that we're... Um, that the ECB is going to buy more bonds before August or something like that, it'll be euro negative. Um, but if he says that everything is going as planned, uh, it will ha likely have no impact. But anyway, I believe reporters will ask many questions about that. This will have a surprising answer by Draghi. If we, about problems with QE or about uh, front loading QE, it'll be euro negative. Second topic, yeah, updated forecasts. Uh, the European Central Bank publishes updated forecasts every three months. Uh, it does that, uh, uh, it did that back in March, and uh, these were upgraded. We're probably going to see a small upgrade to GDP forecasts, even though it came out a bit disappointing. Uh, the big question is about inflation. After we've seen the recent data for, uh, for May, um, which was stronger than expected, Will the ECB raise its inflation forecast for 2015? If it does so, it'll be euro positive. Uh, if not, it'll be, of course, negative, either no change or downgrade. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and of course, this has an impact on the end date of QE, another topic. So, um, Mario Draghi will read the updated forecast at the beginning of the press conference. Um, data for 2016 is a bit less relevant, but changes for this year, for 2015, is very, very important. So if we see an upgrade in inflation forecasts, um, we could see uh, the euro rally. Next, uh, ending QE, of course, this is related to uh, inflation and the recovery. Um, the intended end date is September 2016. Still too far in the future, it's uh, 16, uh, 15 months from now, but questions will be asked, especially from uh, German reporters, and especially after the strong inflation numbers. Uh, of course, if it remains open-ended, it's euro-negative, because we heard in the past that it could be extended beyond 2016. <clears throat> if this is a firm deadline, or if Draghi hints about an early end of QE, it's of course euro-positive. I don't think he'll change anything. He'll say it's data dependent, and in order to see forecasts realized, we need <clears throat> sorry, we need to see um, we need to keep the QE program unchanged. And of course, Greece, um, the ECB had a key role around the crisis. If you remember, 
the ECB changed its rules regarding uh, accepting Greek bonds as collateral, and it, uh, each Wednesday it, uh, raises the level of um, <clears throat> emergency assistance it gives to Greek banks. So uh, I think that Draghi will refuse to answer any questions, will sort of move this hot potato, throw it back to politicians and reporters, say that the ECB is only doing a professional job and it's not political. Of course, this isn't uh, exactly true because each decision is political. And if the ECB is a bit tougher on Greece, uh, it's playing a role in putting pressure. But um, anyway, if we'll have something optimistic from Draghi, it'll be euro positive. If we'll have um, signs of more pressure on Greece, it'll be euro negative. Um, I believe he'll uh, just uh, send shrug off any comments, any questions, and it'll be neutral for the eurozone. But if he says something interesting, it's important to watch. I think Greece will take a significant part of the hour-long press conference. So, conclusion for the ECB before we move to the US. Uh, first topic, front-loading of the QE, buying uh, more bonds now and less later. Um, a confirmation of this uh, could weigh on the euro. Um, higher inflation forecast, that could be uh, positive for the euro. Um, determination on QE, which is something you repeats every time. It's not news, but it still has impact, even though it's not news. Uh, it could weigh on the euro. And Greece, probably nothing, but uh, important to follow. And probably this time, we will not have the confetti lady joining us. All right, so we'll move to the United States, uh, crossing the Atlantic. Um, last time, well, of course, the, bigger, the biggest mover of markets is the Federal Reserve. Uh, the last meeting was held in late April, and the next meeting is in mid-June, in two weeks' time. So, in the middle of April, um, the Fed finally removed any kind of forward guidance. A rate hike can happen anytime, including in June, in theory. It did acknowledge the weakness in uh, the non-farm payrolls in March, but was positive in general. It's uh, uh, Q1 is transitory, um, less, less GDP output due to bad weather, strikes in uh, West Coast ports, and other reasons. And it was optimistic about uh, Q2. So far, the Fed has been vindicated. Q1 has been even worse, and Q1 looks better. Since then, um, the general uh, um, mantra from the from the Fed is that it remains data dependent, um, and uh, June meeting is very very important because it includes a, a press conference and updated forecasts, just like the ECB. We have so much data until then. The, and this non from payrolls on this Friday, June fifth, is very very important, of course. I think that a September hike uh, has higher chances now, but nothing is certain. In theory, it could happen in June in July when there is no press conference, uh, but markets are currently pricing it in uh, December, only towards the end of the year. Um, Yellen reaffirmed in a speech that a hike will come uh, in 2015. Of course, it's every, everything is data dependent, but uh, some uh, market participants had expected the Fed to push it back to 2016, and when there are bigger chances of it happening in 2015 this year. So, um, in general, if the non-farm payrolls is not a disaster, September is on the cards, in my opinion. If the non-farm payrolls report is amazing, rate hike could still come in theory in June, but it needs to be really, really amazing. If the data is uh, less than okay, as Americans say, if it's terrible once again, like March, only 85,000 or something like that, hike is expected only in December. So um, the timing of the first US rate hike has a huge impact on, on the dollar. Um, even though um, the balance sheet of the Fed remains large because it stopped buying new bonds in October, it stopped the QE program, but it didn't squeeze back the balance sheet. So the Federal Reserve has a bloated balance sheet of $4.5 trillion, and um, it's important to remember that. And it's also important to remember that the pace of rate hikes will be gradual. So we might see a rate hike, you know, let's say in September, and then a pause in October and then another rate hike in December, and then a pause for a few more meetings. So, um, after the, but the timing of the first rate hike, which will be a story, uh, one that, that belongs to history books, because we haven't seen a rate hike in something like eight years, 
um, it could be a different story for the dollar. But for now, uh, the timing of the first rate hike is, of course, um, more important. See the question? We'll answer the questions at the end. Um, so recent U.S. data, uh, well, Q1 was terrible. It was uh, downgraded to uh, contraction of 0.7% in the revised uh, figure. Uh, but we have seen some rebounds for Q2. For instance, durable goods orders, which were very worrying for many months. It showed the lack of investment in the U.S. economy. They're finally rebounding. Uh, manufacturing PMI released yesterday uh, rebounded from the lows to over 52 points, showing this some kind of stronger growth. Consumer confidence is off the highs, but it's stabilized, it stopped falling. And um, housing sector, especially building permits, but also housing starts and also sales of homes are back on track uh, after the week, uh, the cold winter. In addition, uh, core inflation is still strong and headline inflation is, uh, is not important for the Fed. That's very different from the ECB, which officially looks at headline inflation. So core inflation is at a solid 1.8%, close to that magic number of 2%. Uh, jobless claims have been a bit confusing, but they're still at their lowest level since the year 2000, 15 years. So it's uh, good news. And we had some improvement in the employment cost index, a measure that shows that also wages are beginning to rise very gradually. All in all, the situation is quite all right in the U.S. economy, on inflation and in jobs, which are the Fed's uh, mandates. The Fed has a dual mandate of price stability and um, of full employment. So moving on, let's look back at last uh, month's non-farm payrolls. It was for the month of April. Headline of 223,000 was was okay. It was exactly as expected. Um, we had, on the other hand, a disappointing downwards revision for March. Only 85,000 jobs were created for March. This could be changed once again. And this report, unemployment rate dropped to 5.4%, which is excellent. And it came on top of a rising participation rate. So the participation rate in the U.S. economy is quite low, but at least we had a fall in the unemployment rate with the rise in the participation rate. In too many non farm payrolls reports, we had unemployment falling, but with less people counted in the workforce, so it's not, not, not that serious. Regarding wage growth, it was a mixed release. We had a month over month a rise of only 0.1%, but um, annual wage growth was 2.2%, which was much better and quite encouraging. What's called the real unemployment rate, or U6, is a measure that counts also discouraged workers. This rose to 10.8%. Uh, sorry, it dropped to 10.8%, which is uh, good news, but these are baby steps in, in the right direction. So what are we expecting now? Now we will we'll get the report for uh, May with revisions for April and, uh, and March. Um, current expectations stand at 226,000, very, very similar to last month. We'll have on Wednesday releases of the ADP report for the private sector and the ISM non-manufacturing PMI, that's the services sector, um, which both are good indicators and they shape market expectations, so expectations could still change. Um, but usually they don't change too much. And the unemployment rate is expected to remain at 5.4% and we're expected to see a higher rise in average hourly earnings and wages to a level of 0.2%. Um, so. Uh, expectations are sort of more of the same, um, nothing very, not too high, not too low. In general, if we have uh, uh, non-farm payrolls showing a gain of over 250,000 jobs, it'll be positive for the US dollar no matter what. If we'll have under 200,000, it'll be negative for the dollar no matter what. If we have something in between, which is quite likely, uh, more of the same as I mentioned, um, it depends on the wages. Um, so, wage inflation uh, is the source of core inflation. If people are getting back to the job market and their salaries rise, they spend more, it lifts inflation. It's sort of the um, virtuous cycle that is still uh, lacking because it's a very weak recovery in the last six years. Um, it's still subdued hardly above 2%. 0.2% uh, is expected now. We know that wages rise only very slowly, only when changing jobs around the end of the year. 
but I'm still hopeful they will accelerate because we're seeing the employment cost index rising and other measures on the rise. We had a year over year uh, rise of 2.2% in April and hopefully we'll get something better in May. So NFP conclusion, uh, we're expecting uh, if it's above 250,000, it's positive, under 200,000 negative. In between, it depends on uh, wages. If they're above 2.2%, above last month's number, it'll be positive, or if it'll be under 2%, it'll be negative. Uh, we need uh, something, uh, we need good data to keep the, the ball rolling. <clears throat> so what's next for your dollar? Uh, it's been quite exciting. I hope it'll continue this way. <clears throat> Uh, this week we're seeing, uh, especially today, well, we're seeing a uh, weakness in the euro in, in the US dollar. It's not only against the euro because of Greece, uh, but a bit a bit wider after we've seen lots of strength in recent weeks. So the non-farm payrolls could stop this uh, dollar weakness. On the other hand, on Friday it's the deadline for Greece. So if we have some, we have smiles in Athens and in Brussels, we have a deal on Greece. It could boost the euro. So. Um, in the short term, we could have lots of volatility at you know, interesting times. I advise everybody in these times not to use high leverage because moves are a bit extreme. But for the longer term, I still see um, it's it's not we haven't seen the lows of the year. I think so far, I believe uh, we're now at 111 or more or less. I think we were, we still have a chance of seeing euro dollar parity later in the year in the year, especially towards and around the U.S. rate hike because of the biggest theme in the markets, that's monetary uh, policy divergence. Um, but perhaps a month after the hike, maybe in October, euro dollar could begin a real recovery and uh, rise and rise because uh, it's important to remember a weaker euro helps the European economies and eventually the euro could enjoy that to rise. That's my opinion. And uh, now we have time for uh, questions. Uh, what's the next direction of your dollar or anything else you want to ask? I already see one question. What do you mean you're negative or you're positive? Well, um, that if, if we have, um, for instance, when I spoke about a deal for Greece, um, that's of course positive for the euro. It's good news for the uh, eurozone. It's positive for the euro. Another thing that could be positive is if um, Draghi mentions that QE could end uh, sooner rather than later. And your negative could be QE going on and on, and um, or uh, lower forecasts for the eurozone. This could weigh on the euro. So that's these are sort of the main themes that um, impact the euro directly. More uh, questions. In the meantime, I'll wait for more questions. We have more, more time for questions. Um, I'll take the opportunity, as always, to thank FX Rate for hosting the webinar. As always, you're welcome to visit forexcrunch.com. And um, join the newsletters. The contact details are here. There are applications for iOS and Android. And you're welcome to listen to the Market Movers podcast, which also has its own uh, new website. Um, I see here a few questions. I'm not sure I understand. The first one, Euro Hello. What do you think about gold? Um, well, I'm not following gold very closely. Uh, I think it's trading in range, but I'm, I don't have a clear opinion about that. Um, why did the Aussie rates well, the, bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia earlier this morning decided not to change the rates. More importantly, it wasn't too dovish. Many in the markets expected um, the RBA to hint about the rate cut later this year, and we didn't have any clear hint like that. So uh, the market was positioned for bad news, and when this bad news didn't come, we've seen uh, the Aussie rise back up. Um, when Yellen starts uh, to raise interest rates, Will the price movement be something like the same when the SMB? No, 
I, the SMB decision in January was a big shock to the markets. Uh, it wasn't expected at all. It was a big shock. So, and the rate hike in the United States is um, sort of communicated for such a long time. Of course, it's a big event. It's, a, it's to the history books, but uh, it's not. Um, it won't be a shock. I think it will have a big impact, but it will, will not force any forex brokers to go out of business or anything like that. Oh, thank you very for the very uh, kind words. Um, Euro value, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, higher value of the Euro is positive, yeah. If we have good news, it's Euro positive and the Euro goes higher, yeah. So that's a question to the answer. More, more questions? You're welcome. When did the ACB buy more? Do your bond fail today? Well, the ECB is buying bonds since March 9th. This includes German bonds and uh, Spanish uh, letras and uh, Italian bonos or whatever they're called. Anyway, uh, we had markets buying bonds in anticipation of the ECB and this went a bit too far and then we had a correction and we had a sell-off. Um, I didn't follow, must say I didn't follow the exact moves today. Uh, but in general, there is some talk in the markets that there's a bubble in bonds, not only European bonds, but also US bonds. So um, the ECB in any case has a limit. It buys also bonds with negative yields, but the limit is uh, minus 0.20%, uh, which is the negative deposit rate. Um, when we have lower uh, wounds or lower lower bond yields in general in the Eurozone. This is, of course, um, negative for the Euro because then US bonds become more attractive. Uh, but that's only one part of the markets. I think we have to focus on the ECB QE program and the Fed's um, timing of the rate hike. These are the main uh, factors. Any more uh, questions? In any case, tomorrow between uh, 12.30 GMT and um, 1.30 GMT, we'll have lots of action in the Euro. Everybody will be listening to Draghi. Would you buy Boons? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't trade bonds anyway, so uh, I don't know. I mean, if you're if you're afraid of um, bonds, were very popular when there was a danger of countries leaving the eurozone. It's sort of a safe haven thing. Um, I don't know. The movements are quite strong in bonds, but I I focus on foreign exchange and the euro and the dollar and other currencies, not on German bonds. We, tomorrow we have an exciting day with the ADP, the ECB press conference, ISM non-manufacturing PMI, and the employment component. We'll have um, sort of aftershocks from the ECB on Thursday and preparation for the NFP on Friday. Very important week. So for those trading the Aussie, we have GDP. Um, so first week of the month is always exciting. Last question, anybody, before we wrap up?
<clears throat> All right. Okay. So thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, FX Street, for hosting the webinar. Oh, just one last question. When can we make good money on trading goons? I don't know. I, as I said, I don't trade uh, goons. Uh, take us through your day, things to consider. Well, looking at the bigger picture, monetary policy divergence, so the bigger trend is still down. And then uh, the daily indicators. For example, today we had uh, inflation figures in the Eurozone. They had an impact. Um, we had uh, factory orders in the US. Um, but we had uh, news from Greece. And that's now, it can happen at any moment, so we can't know exactly when this will happen, that, that that's what triggered the bigger rally today. So there are many things to consider and we are a bit out of time. So uh, uh, anyway, hope this gives sort of just a bit of an answer to your question. Um, thank you very much, everybody. You can see a recording later on of um, this webinar in the archives. I have the link there. Thank you, FX Read again. You're welcome to visit Forex Crunch and download the apps and listen to the Market Movers podcast. And I hope to see you guys uh, next month. Uh, trade safely. Remember not to use high leverage in such markets. And I apologize again for the delay. We hope not to have technical issues next time. All right. So thank you very much. And thank you, FX Streets, as always. And uh, bye bye. <laughs>